from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. Good evening, Secretary Albright, Secretary Powell, members of Congress, Dr. Billington, Ms. Compton, distinguished guests, and aloha to the students and faculty of the University of Hawaii watching via live stream at locations around the university campus. I am Jane McAuliffe, the director of the John W. Kluge Center, and on behalf of the Library of Congress, it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening as we embark on a wonderful five-year collaboration with the Daniel K. Anui Institute, a collaboration in which we will commemorate the life, legacy, and values of the late Senator Daniel Anui. This is the moment when I'll ask you to silence any electronic devices, and we'll remind you that this event is being filmed for placement on the library's website. I'd like to begin this evening by taking this opportunity to recognize the Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. As you are no doubt aware, last month Dr. Billington announced that he will retire from the position of librarian effective January 1st, 2016. He was sworn in as the 13th Librarian of Congress on September 14th, 1987. By that time, he was already an esteemed professor, historian, and author, a Rhodes Scholar, a U.S. Army veteran, and the director of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Under his extraordinary leadership, the Library of Congress has preserved America's founding documents and rich national patrimony, while simultaneously building its global collections in, to represent diverse nations and cultures in 470 languages. He has initiated intellectual and educational programming that has touched millions worldwide and expanded the library's global reach through innovative delivery of collections, research, and information via the World Wide Web. Dr. Billington has been a visionary, a leader, and a champion for the values embodied in this venerable institution namely the values of deeply reasoned, evidence-based research, the necessity for dispassionate perspectives to address global challenges, and an enduring appreciation for the diversity of cultures, languages, and heritages around the world. Thank you, Dr. Billington, for leadership in making this event and countless similar events possible for nearly 30 years. One of Dr. Billington's signature accomplishments was the creation of the Kluge Center, funded through the generosity of the renowned philanthropist John W. Kluge. The Kluge Center is this year celebrating its 15th anniversary. It is a residential research center in the Library of Congress where we support, showcase, and celebrate scholarship. We host over 100 senior and junior scholars every year, we mount dozens of public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs. And every few years, we award the Kluge Prize, which recognizes lifetime achievement in the study of humanity, and which this year will be awarded in the amount of a million and a half dollars. This evening, we are inaugurating the Daniel K. Inouye Lecture Series. Daniel Inouye was a preeminent figure in Washington and in his home state of Hawaii. He was born on September 7th, 1924 in Honolulu. Finished high school within six months after the U.S. entered into the war against Japan. Inui postponed university completion to become the youngest member of the famous 442nd Regiment of the U.S. Army, a unit of Japanese American soldiers who fought gallantly in the European theater of operations. 
On April 21st, 1945, he was severely wounded in battle and lost his right arm. In 1947, he returned home with a distinguished service cross, a bronze star, a purple heart, and 12 other medals and citations. Inouye then completed his undergraduate education at the University of Hawaii and went on to law school at George Washington. In 1953, he was elected to the Territorial House of Representatives, and when Hawaii became the nation's 50th state, Inouye became Hawaii's first representative to the U.S. House. In 1962, he was elected to the U.S. Senate as America's first Japanese-American senator. In nearly a half century in Washington, Senator Inouye served as a member of the Senate Watergate Committee, chairman of the Senate Iran-Contra Committee, and as a long-time member of the Senate Appropriations Committee, which he chaired from 2009 to 2012. Senator Inouye died on December 17, 2012. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for his military service and was posthumously awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the first senator to receive both awards. Tonight, the John W. Kluge Center at the Library of Congress and the Daniel K. Inouye Institute launch a five-year distinguished lecture series to commemorate Daniel Inouye's commitment to bipartisanship, moral courage, public service, and civic engagement. For each of the next five years, an annual program in this series will focus on a theme that reflects these principles. Tonight, we address bipartisanship and the U.S. engagement with the world around us, exploring how leaders have cast aside political differences at home in order to act in the nation's best interest abroad and how they might do so in the future. This event is made possible by a generous donation from the Daniel K. Inouye Institute. We're privileged this evening to have the senator's widow and the driving force behind his legacy, Mrs. Irene Inouye, in attendance. I would also like to acknowledge the senator's son, Ken Inouye. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the distinguished panelists who tonight will address shared values in U.S. foreign policy. Former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright served in that position from 1997 to 2001, the first woman to hold the position in United States history. She was born in Prague, Czechoslovakia, and immigrated to the United States with her family in 1948. Secretary Albright became a U.S. citizen in 1957 and rose to prominence with a distinguished academic and political career before being appointed ambassador to the United Nations by President Clinton and then Secretary of State. She wrote her dissertation at the Library of Congress on the role of the Czechoslovak press in the Prague Spring. Former U.S. Secretary Colin Powell served in that position from 2001 to 2005, the first African-American to head the Department of State. He was born in Harlem, New York, the son of, Japanese, of Jamaican immigrants. He was a war veteran with a distinguished career as a high-profile military officer, national security advisor, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staffs. Powell was appointed Secretary of State by President George W. Bush. Andrea Mitchell was unable to be here tonight as she is on assignment in Vienna covering developments in nuclear talks between world leaders and Iran. So we are delighted to have Anne Compton with us this evening, a distinguished journalist and former White House correspondent for ABC News. Thank you, Anne, so much for your willingness to participate in this event with us. At the end of the panelist conversation, we will allot a few moments for questions. Index cards and pencils will be distributed. 
So please write your question and hand it to one of the ushers who will bring it forward. And we will certainly do our best to address as many questions as possible in the time available. Will you now join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists to the stage? to a look back, but also a look forward in the search for those shared values in American foreign policy. When I first arrived, if you'll forgive me just a personal comment, first arrived to cover the White House more than 40 years ago. This nation had been torn apart by both uh, the Watergate scandal, which brought down a president, and by Vietnam, which was a war in its last painful days. But even then, as a young novice covering the national government, I learned that one of the first lessons was that, uh, that the very American principle of when it comes to American engagement overseas, partisan politics should stop at the water's edge. Those were the words of a Republican Senator, Arthur Vandenberg, who was not only chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, but he was president pro tem, which meant he was third in line to the succession of the presidency. And yet, as a Republican, he worked very hard with Democratic President Harry Truman in those crucible days right after World War II. Politics as we all know, no longer stops at the water's edge. And please welcome two very strong intellects who have experienced all this for themselves. And I'd like to invite quick opening statements, if you will, uh, from Secretary Madeleine Albright, whom I covered as a Secretary of State in the uh, second Clinton term, and then she handed the reins of power to uh, Secretary Colin Powell in the George W. Bush administration. Secretary Albright. <clears throat> well, thank you, Anne, and I'm delighted to be here. And Dr. McCullough, thank you very much. Um, this is kind of a perfect event. First of all, aloha. And then uh, <laughs> also because it combines so many different aspects uh, in terms of Jim Billington's incredible service. Um, I was able to be a scholar at the Wilson Center when he was there. and. Um, he clearly is somebody that had a huge effect on Russia, Soviet Union, Soviet policy. Then, um, as was mentioned, I did my dissertation here. And then Senator Inouye was really a remarkable senator that I had the honor to appear before and work with, and so it is great. And then with my really good friend, Colin Powell. Um, on the issue um, of bipartisanship, I feel very, very strongly about it. And people may find this hard to believe, but I was very good friends with Jesse Helms when he was chairman of the committee. Uh, first of all, well, we first got together when I was ambassador at the United Nations, and he called me up because he wanted me to go and speak at a women's college in Raleigh. And he said it was the uh, bicentennial and I should do that. And to be frank, I thought I could get out of it by saying, I will do this if you go with me. So he said, well, I'll call you back. And in half an hour, he called back, and he said, I'm going with you. So when somebody has invited you somewhere and they have to introduce you, they're not going to say, this is the stupidest person I ever met. So uh, he, I'm going to remember. Uh, All of you remember that. He gave me a very nice introduction. We had a very interesting time. And I was able, because the students there asked questions about the United Nations, to answer them in exactly the way that they needed to be answered. And he heard them. So then he said, I want you to come with me to my alma mater. Um, and we did that, and what happened was that we were driving around North Carolina um, looking for barbecue places, and then by the time we get there, he was partially bionic already with uh, artificial hips, and so I'm helping him get out of the car, and I'm hanging on to him for dear life, and some cameraman took a picture, and the title was The Odd Couple. Uh, uh, <clears throat> So then, when I was named to be Secretary of State, he said to me, Ms. Madeline, we will make history together. 
and we actually did. And so, and it made a difference. We disagreed on many things, but I thought that it was the Vandenberg style, and it really made a difference to be able to. And then I have to say, the last part, my best friend here is my successor. Uh, we disagree on some things, but we mostly agree on everything, and it's an example of bipartisanship. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Alma. <laughs> It's a great pleasure to be here this evening, and aloha to the students at the University of Hawaii. And I thank the Kluge Center and the Inouye Institute Center for putting this together and supporting us for the next five years. I knew Senator Dan very, very well. Um, when he was chairman of the Defense Subcommittee and uh, was my man for money, uh, while I was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I used to illustrate to my staff what it was like to deal with giants in the Congress. My staff would march in and complain about some issue uh, that, you know, we're, we're not getting the money we need and the Congress won't release it. You've got to do something. We don't know what to do. We're, we're lost. And I would say, fine, leave the room, please. Uh, and I would pick up the phone and I would say, uh, get the good senator for me. And when Dan got on the phone, I would say, hey, Dan Colon, God, Dan Colon, what do you need? I said, I really got a problem, and this is a no kidding problem. I really need this money. Done. That was it. It was over. No further discussion. Now, I didn't do that too often, but I did it often enough to get what I needed. And that was a kind of, that's a, but that's the kind, of, kind of leader he was. We don't see enough of these leaders in Congress now. People who, I call them the cardinals of the Congress. They had power, and they exercised that power, and they always exercised it for the good of the country. And so I will always remember his soft, quiet, steel-like mood, the way he went about his business. And I will never forget the fact, as a soldier, uh, the sacrifices he made in the 442nd, the Gopher Broke Regiment. And the reality for all of you to know is that he was not allowed to enlist in the Army until 1943. And that was after they allowed Japanese, Nisa, Japanese Americans to join the United States Army to fight for America, while many other Japanese were still being interred in camps. And uh, he took that opportunity and entered as an enlisted man and left uh, in 1947 as a captain in the United States Army. And so Danny was a great leader, a great senator, a great member of Congress. And I think he would uh, be very honored to know that this was being held in his honor and in recognition of his, of his service to the country. Speaking of service to country, I also have to say a word about Jim Billington. Not only has he been a distinguished librarian of Congress, but I really used to work with him during the Reagan days when I was national security advisor to President Reagan in the last two years of the Reagan administration. And we were going through that period of uh, understanding the new Soviet Union. Uh, when uh, Gorbachev was telling us all about Glasnost and Perestroika, and we were listening very carefully. Could we trust this guy? Uh, and Billington was called in constantly by President Reagan for his advice, and we all relied on Jim for his advice. It was hard as a soldier to listen to Gorbachev say all these things <laughs> about Glasnost and Perestroika, and I actually went to Moscow once and had him lecture me about, you, know, you don't understand, I'm changing things, and you're just a soldier, you've never... You've never considered the kinds of things that I might be able to do. And so you've got to remove that soldier's mindset and listen carefully. And he was getting more and more annoyed with me, and I was getting more and more annoyed with him. And I kept thinking, <laughs> I, said, I didn't come here to be lectured by this guy. You know, I don't care what he says, he's still a commie. I mean, it's just, you know. <laughs> and so finally, uh, President Gorbachev stops talking, and uh, he knows he's not making the sale. He stops talking. And he looks up and then gets an idea, and he looks back down, and he looks directly across from me, and he smiles. And he just looks to me and leans forward, and he says, ah, generale, generale, I'm so very, very sorry. You will have to find a new enemy. <laughs> 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 and I thought to myself, I don't want to. I've invested 30 years in this enemy. Just because you're having a bad year, why do we have to change, you know? <laughs> but that was the end, of, uh, that was the end of, a, of a world that had structure in it. Matthew and I have been talking about this repeatedly. There was structure in that world. The red side of the map and the blue side of the map, we competed for what used to be called the third world and the second world. But there was structure. 
And then the Soviet Union went away, Gorbachev went away, and we had what we thought would be a new world order. But it turned out not to be the, quite the new world order that we had hoped for or expected. And we will discuss in the course of the evening how all of that has transpired and where we are now. Um, I take some exception to uh, uh, politics cannot be nonpartisan. Politics are always partisan. That's what a democracy is all about. So politicians have to debate and argue with each other, and hopefully they will come into alignment. But in my experience of many years here in Washington, there has always been a split vote in just about everything uh, because there are different points of view. And those different points of view have to be reconciled by appealing to the shared values that connect us all together. Uh, but the only time you see anything that is bipartisan is after they've taken a vote and we've got the result. But until then, it's very partisan, even when you're talking about the water's edge, because that's the nature of our system. That's how our founding fathers created it. That's how we have practiced it successfully for these over 230 odd years. And that's what I hope we will get into talking about. Let, let me ask about something very uh, here and now, very in the present. Your successor, uh, John Kerry, is today in Vienna in double overtime at negotiations uh, with Iran on a nuclear deal. And the, the bitter and often sharp criticism coming here from members of Congress, uh, from political candidates who say this deal will bring on war. Um, that has to be, that is a creation of the current times. How do you deal with that if you're the uh, Secretary of State sitting in that, uh, sitting that chair? I, I do, I agree with Colin about our system, and it's um, something that brings us vibrancy and interest, and we can talk about the role of Congress in foreign policy. All you have to do is read the Constitution to know that it's a, a shared responsibility and books have been written about that it's an invitation to struggle. I think the question is, and some about the water's edge part, is when members of Congress go abroad and criticize the President and the United States and make it Great. complicated, and then people don't know what the voice is. I do think, I would not frankly like to be in, we were both in negotiations. It is hard when the domestic uh, echo is out there and it's different and you have to try to explain what is going on. I think the Iranians actually are also trying to explain what their domestic politics are. And I think the thing that has changed is there is more discussion everywhere. But it's difficult. I can just imagine that John Kerry thinks, okay, please, I've had enough of this. I've got to deal with the Iranians, not you, Senator McCain. <laughs> That was not nice. <laughs> you were the one who said you liked this. I rest my case with respect to partisan. <laughs> um, I don't know what will emerge from the uh, negotiations in Vienna. They've been going on for 10 years. They started when I was Secretary of State. And it's a very difficult issue. And I think something will come out of it. It may not be satisfactory to all, uh, some more compromises will have to be made, but anything that seems to slow down or restrain whatever the Iranians have in mind are worth, is worth considering. But I would not make a judgment on what they're coming up with until I see it. We don't know. But I would like to make this point. We are so consumed with this nuclear deal with the Iranians that we're kind of not paying attention to all the other things that are doing that are far more serious right now in the present time. Uh, they are making inroads at Iraq. They're making inroads in Yemen. They're making inroads in Syria. They're making inroads in Beirut. They're doing a lot of meddlesome thumb. And even if we had a nuclear agreement with them, they are still the number one sponsors of terrorism in the world. So while we are focusing on nuclear weapons, as we should, and I think something will emerge there, uh, we should not forget all of these other problems that we have with the Iranians and the difficulty they're causing us elsewhere in the world. And it's a spreading difficulty. They're, they're, on, a, they're on a roll right now. Um, now, with respect to nuclear weapons, I've been around them since I was a young captain, 25 years old. And the one thing I'm pretty much convinced of after being in this business for so many years is they really aren't usable. The Soviets couldn't use their 28,000. I couldn't use the 28,000 that were under my supervision. The Iranians say they're not developing a nuclear weapon, I don't believe them, I don't trust them, no reason to trust them. Yeah. 
So I would include as part of our policy a clear statement to the Iranians. Uh, we don't trust you. We want to verify everything you're saying, but you need to understand that deterrence and containment still work. And you need to understand that if you ever use one of these things, or we thought you were going to use one of these things, against any of our interests, our friends, or against uh, our allies, or against us, uh, we would take action that would destroy your regime, which is the and, one thing And isn't that a shared value? I mean, that, that is something on which Washington... We, we, had, we had a shared value with respect to nuclear weapons throughout the entire period of the Cold War. Uh, and as a result, they were never used. And I, I don't think, you know, people say, well, if the, Iran the Iranians are crazy. They may be crazy, but they're very clever in their negotiations. Yeah. And secondly, they also know that they don't want to commit suicide. And we ought to make it clear to them that if you ever use one of these things, you're committing suicide. Secretary Albright, you mentioned shared responsibility with Congress, but is it responsible for Congress to have 47 members of the United States Senate write to an ayatollah uh, while, this, while this process is underway? That's not the kind of shared you're talking about, is Definitely it? not, and especially by a senator that just got there, didn't even know where the bathroom was. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really found it. What, what is the proper role? <laughs> what did you have for dinner? I haven't eaten yet. <laughs> Eat. What, not to dwell on this too long, but what is the kind of proper role for Congress? I have seen over the years that I've covered Washington, uh, more members of Congress or leader members of Congress sometimes invited to, the to a negotiation site. There are certainly as congressional consultation. Both of you spent long hours on Capitol Hill at various times during your uh, tenure uh, trying to brief members of Congress so they would understand what you do. But uh, we also have a fight every time that the president does or does not want uh, authorization for use of military force. Well, let me just say, first of all, I, I was a chief legislative assistant to Senator Ed Muskie, who was chairman of the Budget Committee and somebody who took his responsibilities very seriously in terms of bipartisanship. Uh, the first thing he wanted to do was to talk to Senator Henry Bellman from Oklahoma, who was his ranking member, and worked out how they were going to deal with a whole new budget process. And then also the amount of time that he spent consulting um, and wanting to be consulted. I do believe very much in consultation. We both spent a lot of time on the Hill, um, and I think that is absolutely essential, whether in hearings, uh, or in uh, private sessions. I think that's important. I also do think, uh, Colin was talking about the nuclear talks, basically there were congressional advisors that would go, um, that were part of a, a process where they would go to the negotiations. They would not be at the table um, negotiating, but they were very much a part of it. And I think that part is absolutely essential. They're not blindsided. By they are not blindsided, and I think that that is, that is an issue. I think one of the questions and it does come out of the Vietnam War, is the War Powers Act. And the question in terms of what Congress's role is, um, that clearly history shows that the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, there were all kinds of questions about it. Um, and there is a process now. I think the hard part here is that I do think that Congress obviously has a role, and it's important for the administration to always um, uh, inform what's going on. There is always the question about the constitutionality of the War Powers Act, and so you would never say in accordance with the War Powers Act, but consistent, uh, consistent with, um, in order not to cross that line. But this is the problem. If Congress wants to do this, they have to, those are not easy votes. And so if you're going to be a part of it, you have to be willing to take the hard votes, and that's the issue. But I, I do, it's, it's the basis of our system. And then, by the way, I agree on compromise, the, pro, the fact of compromise. But at this stage, compromise is a four-letter word to a lot of people. It is the basis of our system. And that's relatively new within the last few yeah. years. But for instance, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute, and we do dem democracy work across the world. And they, people ask us, so what's the basis of democracy? And you say compromise, and they say, yeah, like you guys. So at, the, <laughs> at this moment, we are not exactly providing a good model. But the Constitution. Um, really is written in a very careful way on this. Article 1 is the role of Congress and so the legislative branch, and so it's set up in that way. 
I couldn't agree uh, more with, uh, with Madeline. And I've negotiated about a half a dozen arms control agreements, and, and Madeline has done likewise. There are always differences of opinion. There are always people who are objecting to one part of it or another. And the role of the administration is to take those objections and find compromises and then find consensus. Uh, the example I like to use of, of how it's supposed to work is what our, what our founding fathers did in Philadelphia in 1787. Look at the differences of opinion that existed in that room. Yet they came up with what the House of Representatives should look like, the Senate, the power of the presidency, our legal system, our economic system, the military system. They did it all in a few weeks' time. They even had to deal with the worst issue they were facing, that was slavery. It was a terrible result, but they had to compromise because only through compromise in a political system can you gain consensus, and only when you gain consensus can you move ahead. And right now, we do not have a Congress that seems to believe in that any longer. Uh, it's the worst I've ever seen it in my many years uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, they are not working to achieve compromises. They're not talking to each other, they're not sharing. The Founding Fathers would go off and drink and have cigars every night. Um, we wouldn't want cigars any longer, but nevertheless, <laughs> They should find a way to spend more time with each other and reflect. Part of the problem is the media. That was my next question. <laughs> you knew this was coming, Ann. We've done this before. My next question. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we've, we've reached a, a point in the country where between the cable news and Twitter feeds and everything else like that, you find it difficult to stake yourself out because you're gonna get beat to death that night, either on the tweets coming in or on cable. And the cable channels seem to reinforce the views of the people who watch that channel and they never hear anything else. And it's on both the left and the right, not picking anybody in particular, but it reinforces views and does not encourage people to listen to the other side. And so it makes it very, very hard to, to run government this way and to run out and to and press our shared values. No question as a journalist who worked my entire career for one network, but to have seen uh, uh, talk radio, then cable talk television, and now the, uh, the echo chamber of the internet, I keep trying to figure out if I can understand why it has developed like that and why Americans very often gravitate to a news source where they have a comfort zone rather than being willing to listen to both sides? And has our attention span as Americans gotten so short? We used to tease USA Today reporters who are excellent at somebody. Someday one of them will get a Pulitzer for the best investigative paragraph. <laughs> uh, well, let me first of all back up on something. I've just finished a terrific book by John Ellis on called The Quartet, which describes the way that the Constitution was written and the compromises that were made. I really recommend that in terms of exactly yep. what you were talking about. I do think that what has happened and is a real problem is people only listen to what they agree with uh, already. And it, it does create an issue um, in terms of what they know. Um, I have already established my creds here. Basically, what I do as I drive, I listen to right-wing radio. It's amazing that I haven't run over somebody or uh, <laughs> uh, been arrested. Uh, but I do think it's important to hear what people are saying and not just listen. But I think that generally what we're looking at is the role of technology in terms of diplomacy and in terms of decision-making. And um, I have been fascinated by what's happened in terms of technology, obviously terrific in terms of connecting and a variety of things that we now know each other, but politically what it has done is disaggregate voices. And this is true here and also abroad. So for instance, what I've talked about a lot is how do people get from Tahrir Square to governance? Tahrir Square was social media, and I stole this statement from somebody, but it works so well, which is people are talking to their governments on 21st century technology. The government hears them on 20th century technology and is providing 19th century responses. <laughs> and so there are no confidence in institutions. And so our problem is generally, how do we, do we trust our institutions? Who does what? Where does the information come from? And it's true of national institutions and international institutions. And it's basically mayors that have 
people have the most confidence in because they're the closest to the people. <laughs> but I know we usually all get around to blaming the media right away, but the media really does have a lot to do with always trying to beat the system and have the highest ratings. And, um, you know, one gets a little ADD watching with breaking <laughs> news and all the things that well, kind too of much, keep track. Well, Secretary Bell, too much is reduced to a kind of blame game, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, I've invented a word it, uh, to describe the media. You got the Dan? Allow me. <laughs> the word I've invented is celebrification. Yes. Everything has become celebrity driven. So you can turn on a morning news show, you get two minutes of news, and then we're off chasing some celebrity. And it, it has the attention span of, of a gnat that just died. I mean, <laughs> it, it's, it's really bad. So I find myself increasingly watching foreign channels because I get more news on foreign channels and less celebrity Which chatter. Which ones? You can get Al Jazeera here? Well, I'm not going to. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, Russia, no, okay. I used to get Al Jazeera. I don't get it anymore. They, when they went from Al Jazeera America, uh, English to America, right. my system dropped it. But I watch, seriously, BBC, um, I watch uh, France 24, I watch the Russian channel, know your opponent. Uh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got four Chinese channels, and I've got a Korean channel, and uh, Euronews. So it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum. And I like RT a lot, simply because I like to see how they gin up the, co the propaganda that is now pouring out of Russian television. They're very good at it. They are very good at it. A lot of practice. Yeah. 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 Let me move you on to an issue that uh, was mentioned by the, the students and faculty in Hawaii that, uh, that they were interested, two of them actually. One is the, um, the difficulty and the decision making of committing U.S. military forces. Did you really once say to him, as I recall from your book, what's the point of you saving this superb military colon if we can't use it? Okay, well, I have to describe the scene, if I might. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was uh, the Clinton administration was new, and Colin was, had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs and stayed that. We were all coming in. I was there as ambassador to the United Nations, and every single day up in New York, uh, I saw more different diplomats than any other American diplomat, and they would keep saying, why aren't you people doing something about Bosnia? You've got to, you know, people are dying. So we go into the Situation Room, and this very big, handsome general with medals from here to here, uh, <laughs> the hero of the Western world for having won the Gulf War, and then I, a mere mortal female civilian, was uh, 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 trying to figure out whether we could do something, some force. So, um, and Colin, in case you don't know, is the greatest briefer ever. And the Pentagon can provide three-dimensional things, and he had a little red indicator, and, and, and he would, in fact, say, we can do this, literally. And then he'd say, but it will take 500,000 troops and zillions of dollars, and what are you going to say to Sergeant Slepchak when to, uh, when, to his mother when he dies as a result of stepping on a landmine? So I did kind of say, what are you saving this for? So then what happens? He leaves. Uh, and we actually do use force. But when you write books, we've all had this experience. It takes a while to get them out. So I get a call from a journalist who says, so do you agree with what General Powell said about you? And I said, well, what did he say? And he said that he had to patiently explain to Ambassador Albright that our troops were not toy soldiers and that I had practically given him an aneurysm. So uh, I, I call up Colin, and I say, patiently? And he said, yes, you understood nothing. Um, <laughs> and so then he sent me his book, and he wrote, with love, admiration, etc., patiently, Colin. And then I sent him back a note saying, with love, admiration, etc., forcefully, Madeline. <laughs> the real story. <laughs> We're in the Situation Room. I'm left over from the Bush-Reagan years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got nine months left on my term as chairman. 
and it was all Clinton Easters in the room with uh, Madeline. And <laughs> and it, was, it was an odd situation. And so we get into the discussion of Bosnia, and what she actually said was, what's the point of having this great army you're always talking about if we can't use it? That's when I said I thought I would have an aneurysm, yeah. <laughs> because we had just used it in Panama, we had just used it in Desert Storm, we were using it in Somalia, we were using it in many places around the world. And what I've always said, and it's gotten me in trouble before, is before you send these young men and women off to war, you have to have a clear understanding of what you want them to achieve politically, and then once you've made that decision and it can't be done politically or through diplomatic means, you want to use the military, put it in, and put it in in a decisive manner. And uh, I don't think Madeline... <laughs> Madeline didn't mention that that point of view was also the point of view of the National Security Advisor, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, the Vice President, and the President at that time. And we went to Bosnia, it was several years later, long after I'd left. And we won. Uh, and, and, uh, um, but I, I tell you the following thing. First of all, I obviously am, do not have military experience, and, and I, do, I do think that Colin is the hero of the Western world, and I really do think that the way our military has been used. I am somebody that was, spent the war in England. I know what it was like when the Americans yeah. came, and I have been in love with Americans in Un Alma uh, um, forever. <laughs> so, but, so I have the highest respect. But the issue for me is the following, and it still is. Whether there are ways that the United States can, there are not a lot of tools in our toolbox. Um, and I do think that one can't take the use of force off the table because basically force and diplomacy go together um, and then the economic tools. And the question is how to calibrate that. I think one of the issues that I think I would like to know more about even at this stage is whether there is such a thing as a limited war and whether there are ways to use air power um, so that you don't have to use ground forces and that there is a way to stop people from killing each other. Uh, and so the question is, how much do you have to commit? And when you do, I mean, there is the Powell Doctrine, which talks about decisive force, not overwhelming, as you say, decisive. Right. And I think the question is, what is that? I fully agree with Colin. We've had so many discussions about this. One does have to have an exit strategy. One does not, however, and should not have a deadline. I think a deadline I have found in our own case when President Clinton said we'd be out of Bosnia in a year, we couldn't get out, and so our credibility is gone. And I think a deadline becomes a gun to your own head. So I have learned a lot, but I do think there are times that we need to use force and try to figure out what the right way to use it is, and I have learned an awful lot from General Powell. I, I completely uh, agree uh, that... <laughs> I told you, this no, is no, no, this is coming. This is coming. <laughs> we, we won't even go to Rwanda. No. <laughs> While you're taking credit for Bosnia. Well, we should talk about that. Yeah. I mean, because this is, this a, is a, a big issue. But the fact is, you, sh you should have a clear understanding of what you're going to do. I've never asked for an exit strategy. What I look for is what event or what happening on the ground will cause us to say, we have achieved the mission we came here to achieve. And Desert Storm was a perfect example. Uh, when the casualty rate was so low after Desert Storm, everybody was complaining we should have gone to Baghdad. Um, and I said, no, the president said we weren't. The UN got a resolution. The Congress voted for what we did. And we had a great coalition to include a Syrian division and an Egyptian division that were with us. So when we accomplished the mission, we came home, which is what President Bush intended. And we found out 10 years later what it's like when to go to Baghdad. You're still there. And so I think you have to be very, very careful in picking. But I totally agree with Madeline that diplomacy without the possibility of force being used at the end of the diplomatic trail, if it doesn't work, uh, is, is useless. And at the same time, military force shouldn't be used if diplomacy is still an option and diplomacy is still working. So I don't think we have that much of a disagreement any longer. Right, Madeline? Absolutely. We'll be taking questions from uh, the audience here in Washington and from the students uh, at the University of Hawaii shortly. But one of the things that they were uh, interested in talking about was the 
um, the effect of unintended consequences. Now, I assume in the Secretary of State's office, over in the corner, there's this crystal ball, and you just put your hand over it, and you know, oh, that's what the Taliban will do 15 years from now, right? No. Well, the problem, I do think that we do not do enough um, pushing in terms of, first of all, assumptions. I think that um, I've just come from a series of meetings with former foreign ministers where we were really pushing them on assumptions. What are the assumptions? And then the unintended consequences. Yeah. So let's just take one, Iran. What, this is the unintended consequence. It is the 70th anniversary of the dropping of bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I don't know whether physicists felt guilty or President Eisenhower thought we needed to do something different, but in 1953, he gives a speech, Adams for Peace speech, in order to show that nuclear energy could be uh, peacefully used. So under that, that's how the Non-Proliferation Treaty started, the IAEA, and Iran signed the NPT. We are the ones that sold the equipment to Iran. That is an amazing unintended consequence. Afghanistan is an unintended consequence. Um, and I think that part of the problem is that decision makers, first of all, I do not think people sit in their offices trying to make stupid decisions. The bottom line is, where, how much information do you have at the time? And do you push enough in order to try to figure out the unintended consequences? But there is pressure to do something. Um, and one of the issues that I always argue is we need to understand the context of what else is going on. You talked about Rwanda. I mean, part of the issue was we were in Bosnia. Uh, there were refugees coming out of Haiti. Somalia was falling apart. And we didn't actually have the information that people have ex post facto. So that kind of combination of things. But we d I would think, and I think you'd agree, Colin, we don't push enough for the unintended consequences. No, we, there's a theorem in the military that says no plan uh, continues after first contact with the enemy. You always have to consider there's a thinking, breathing situation or enemy on the other side of this equation. And so I've been taught in my military training, always have somebody in the back room making contingency plans and thinking through what the unintended consequences might be. Yeah. I've seen a lot of unsatisfactory thinking with respect to unintended consequences that should have been thought through. I think in the, um, the, the 2003 war in Iraq, um, we went in thinking that this was all just going to snap back together. And things happened that were not planned. We were not supposed to disband the Iraqi army. And the president had been told we wouldn't do that because they were going to be the basis of security. Yet we woke up one morning and it happened. And the unintended consequence was all those soldiers suddenly had an opportunity to get severance pay and then go off and become insurgents. And so I, I totally agree with Madeline. You can't predict all the unintended consequences, but you should think about them and discuss the possibility of these unintended consequences rather than just sit around saying, well, it'll happen and stuff happens. Um, and that's why I think we're, we're, we're stuck in a number of places now because we didn't think through fully the possible consequences. I think though, if I might, is one can't make the decision-making process so gridlocked that you never do anything. No. That's the other part. It's that balance of trying to figure out what you can do and what the instrument is to do it. But I don't think we push enough. And I don't think that we have enough of a system where um, one can dissent at a crucial time. I think that is something that, that is complicated. One, it's one not other. always necessary to use maximum force either. Sometimes it can be very surgical. My favorite example is in December 1989, there was a coup in the Philippines. And we got a call from the Philippine government, please come bomb our airfield so that our pilots cannot join the coup and bomb the palace. And I got the mission to go bomb the airfield. And I thought it through and I said to my folks, no, there's another way to do this. And we called our pilots out in the Philippines at Clark Air Force Base and we said, take off in your phantom jets, go over that airfield and demonstrate extreme hostile intent just buzz the airfield. Mm -hmm. If anybody then takes to the runway, shoot in front of them on the runway. Only if they take off and are heading to the palace, then you shoot them down. So you put things in place so you can see if you can minimize 
the, dang, the problem you're going to have. And when I finally was able to talk to the Philippine Ministry of Defense, he said, oh, thank God, we'd be rioting against you tomorrow morning if you'd done that. And so you, you really have to try to find ways short of full mobilization and massive force. But when massive force will give you the decisive result that you're looking for, as in the first Gulf War, then use it, because we have it. Use it. One other issue I wanted to hit before we open this up to questions, and that is um, the dimension, the importance, the shared values of human rights, democratization, economic development, and Madam Secretary, um, women's rights. I was with you and First Lady Hillary Clinton uh, on trips and then into Beijing for the fourth uh, conference on, on women uh, held by the United Nations. Those are shared values, aren't they? Are they missing from today's equation? I think one of the hardest things to determine is what is in national interest. Under what circumstances, I mean, you use force if, in fact, you are looking at what national interest is. And we all have different definitions. I mean, the clearest one is always when the United States is attacked or our allies are attacked. But one of the issues that, and this was the Rwanda, I mean, on peacekeeping operations generally, is do we think that when there are um, crimes against humanity or hum human rights uh, violations where people are being raped and killed for, not for anything they've done, but because of whatever their ethnic uh, background is, then I happen to think with American values that in fact we do, this isn't a national interest. But that is a big debate. And that is part of the issue as to whether people want to use force or not. Uh, but I, I have, and we all have our own background, you know. Uh, I am definitely uh, am somebody that is, was created by my background of having been raised in war -tum Europe when people didn't stand up. And when uh, Neville Chamberlain made clear about why should we care about people in faraway places with unpronounceable names. We have a lot of that going on now. And so I think the question is, do people see it as national interest? I do think that economic interest, I, I'd never have thought that we are uh, an economically imperial. I have a hard time with that. But I do think that we have to look at the whole picture about what is going on. And then back to the questions you asked is under what circumstances, what force do you use, and what role does Congress play in that? So it becomes, and human rights and, and media in terms of there is, there used to be what we call the CNN effect. People would go someplace where it was on CNN, some were not on it, so and the same number of people were killed, um, and it still didn't make a difference. So there are any number of aspects of this. Secretary Bell. We also have to remember that when we say um, Congress has to act, the President has to act, it's the American people ultimately who are the ones who will make a judgment as to whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing with respect to the use of military force. I think one of the disappointments I've seen in my career is that Congress has pretty much abdicated its role in this. You know, we haven't really declared war on anybody. We've had lots of wars over the last 40 years. And if you look right now, when the president wanted to get a, a statement from the Congress, they don't want to touch it. They don't want their fingerprints on it. They want to avoid it. Let the president handle this. Now, maybe sometimes that's the right answer, but I think it's also a dangerous trend for Congress to just sit back, criticize, or support, depending on how it's going, and not play a role in making this judgment that the Constitution has said they are supposed to make. We are going to stop at this point and begin to take questions. Thank you all, not only in this audience here at the Library of Congress in Washington, but students and faculty at the University of Hawaii who are watching on live stream. And we have Jason from the Library of Congress who is going to be the voice of those questions. He has a fat, thick uh, stack of them. Jason, please, uh, the first question for our guests. So we actually have uh, a similar question, both from Hawaii and from the audience here. The question uh, is, would the two secretaries comment on a time where they felt political pressure to support or oppose a certain policy that they perhaps may not have personally agreed with? Um, I, I was not in a position where I opposed a policy of President Clinton. Um, I think that one of the issues always, um, in, in terms of, believe it or not, he loved to hear us argue in front of him, and we did an awful lot of that. 
And the one that was the most complicated for me was actually, I, I was only UN ambassador at the time of Bosnia, but I was Secretary of State during Kosovo, and I felt that we needed to do something. And so, but I, I was not in that position. I was always uh, of the view that it was my responsibility to tell the president, whether I was chairman, national security advisor, secretary of state, what my view was, whether it was uh, you know, a desired view or not. And so in all of those positions, I would occasionally get in trouble uh, because presidents don't always like to hear you know, opposing views. But I also was blessed to be working for presidents who ultimately would listen to those views and take them into account. But once he has heard everybody's views and has made a decision, then he has to be able to expect loyalty from every member of his team, every cabinet officer, everybody else, or else you have chaos. And yes, there have been areas where I was uh, supported. The president agreed with my brilliant analysis. <laughs> And there were other areas where, uh, uh, Colin, never mind, go back to the building and we'll talk to you later. Um, but if you think that's, that's, that's the same as any business, it's no different than any other group of human beings coming together. It's not different. Uh, but you do owe your boss, you do owe the king or the queen um, your best advice. Otherwise, uh, they shouldn't be paying you. Yeah. Jason, another question? We have several students in the house tonight, and several of them have asked a very similar question, which is, what should students pay careful attention today to in order to solve the challenges of tomorrow? And what are those future challenges? Future challenges? Where, where should young people focus right now? I think that is one of the hardest questions to answer because as Colin said, the system is completely different and it's very interesting because I do teach and I'm trying to kind of um, teach some historical background to what is going on, the unintended consequences, but then also look at a whole series of other issues. I think something that people need to pay more attention to are the role of non-state actors or, you know, we are still kind of in a system where we're looking at the nation state, but there are an awful lot of more players in it. And then trying to figure out who the players are, who are the stakeholders, there's that. The other is that I think people need to know, um, have to focus more on layers within each society. People talk about civil society, mm -hmm. but what does that mean? And you were talking about the American people, but other countries have people in it that in fact need to be um, we need to know what they're thinking in more ways um, and use technology more in a positive way. But I think it's very hard. I mean, we did, gr it was a dangerous time, but it was simple. There was the red and the red, white, and blue. And so the question was, who was seducing who more? And at this moment, it is all um, kind of out um, in, uh, in a way of hard to uh, aggregate. The other part that I think is important in international relations, it isn't just political science and history. It's health and science. The world is not flat. Um, there have to be ways that many more disciplines come into it, and it's much more interdisciplinary so that you can uh, figure out where, where the pressures are. Much, much more complicated than what we had. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Um, in mind, there's something that uh, wonderful gentleman, uh, former Israeli President Shimon Peres, said to me one day after the Cold War was over, and we were at a conference together and he put his arm around me and he said, oh, Colin, Colin, it's, we've lost all our enemies, now all we have are problems. <laughs> and to some extent, that's true. America, the generation of young people here are not facing anything like my other life faced. There is no nation out there with the capacity or the intention of bringing down the United States of America. They don't have, the, they can't do it. So we're probably safer in many ways than we've ever been before. Well, what about terrorism? We've lost roughly 49 people to terrorism since 9-11. That's all. And most of those were homegrown nuts who committed these acts of terrorism. We've killed 32,000 people with guns in that same period of time. And so we have to keep that all in some context. So for the young people here, I would say, while you're thinking about these great issues, uh, get your education become very well-informed, 
stay off all the social networks, or at least part of the time, <laughs> and really study the issues of the day. Uh, I don't think they're spending enough time studying the issues of the day. And I would also say to the young people that while you're looking at foreign policy and looking at the kinds of things that Madeline talked about, we need to realize that our major emphasis has to be here at home in the United States of America. If we want to continue to be the example to the rest of the world, we have to fix some of the things that are not going well in this country. One is our legislative system. And I could list some more that are, that are in my mind anyway, uh, the money in politics, the gerrymandering that's taking place, uh, the fact that we don't have infrastructure construction going on. We're not fixing our infrastructure. Uh, Guantanamo has been a curse on the image of the United States of America for the last uh, 15 years now, I guess, close to 15 years. It ought to be closed immediately. How can we explain to any foreign country uh, what we believe in with respect to a just system and don't have stalags and don't have gulags when we have Guantanamo? Um, I think we have to do something. We have to do something about um, our education system to bring it up to standards. It's getting better and better. My wife runs the America's Promise Alliance and reports that more than 81% of our youngsters now are graduating from high school, but that next 18, 19% is tough. They're in uh, lower income communities, both black and white and, and Hispanic and all the others. And so we have to do something about that. And we have to do something about the disparity in wealth between those at the bottom of the society and those up toward the top of the society. And that's not easy. That's not easy. And just, just to close, just to close this small sermonette. <laughs> immigrant, child of immigrants, how could we continue thinking that it is proper not to have immigration reform? God help us. I would, like, I would like to go to every Trump hotel and ask, <laughs> now wait a minute, hang on, and ask all the employees not to show up tomorrow. <laughs> There'd be nobody there. They're immigrants. Yeah. We're going to take a couple more questions. Jason, what have you got? There are a number of questions that are um, country or region specific. People have questions about China, development in Africa, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the troubles in the European Union. I will take prerogative to collapse those into all one question and uh, <laughs> perhaps yeah. throw it to you to address to the panelists. Well, let, let's start with Good. China because that is a big dynamic and maybe back into the uh, Pacific, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership of that China. Well, I, I do think that it is the most important relationship of the 21st century and, it, and complicated because um, obviously there are those that can argue that China is a threat and then those that can argue that China we need to cooperate with and it's both. And the question is how to manage that um, in a way that is uh, where we can actually help each other on, th I, I'm not a good enough historian, maybe Jim can help on this, is that whether there has ever been a time that two major powers have been so dependent on each other, um, where their economy and ours are intertwined in a way, and so that cooperation part is very important. Uh, there are things about China that concern me. Um, they're not interested in just a bunch of rocks, they're interested in what's under them. Um, and the oil issues, and they are resource hungry in any number of things, and I do think that is of concern. I am concerned by rising nationalism in China, um, and all you have to do is go like that, and they are anti-Japanese, and so that bothers me a great deal. But I think it is the most important relationship. Xi Jinping is um, making clear that the Communist Party is in charge. He's using the corruption legislation to get rid of people he doesn't like. So there are very many trends going on there, but I do think it's an essential, the essential relationship. I think it is our most important relationship, frankly. And I've been going to, to China for like, oh, 45 years now. I went in right after Nixon as a young lieutenant colonel when they were just coming out of the Cultural Revolution. What they've done in the last 40 odd years 
with respect to uh, their economy and bringing people up into the middle class have been astonishing. But let's not, uh, let's not overplay that because they've still got 800 million people that they have to take care of who have not yet entered the middle class. So they've got their set of problems. They've got their set of issues. I do not think China will be a military threat. Uh, it, it's not in their interest to be a military threat to the United States of America. They're holding a trillion and a half dollars of U.S. paper, um, and they got the greatest business model imaginable. Sell to Walmart, get the money from Walmart, and then loan it back to the United States so they could pay their deficit off. They're not going to throw that away. I mean, that is great. And so we have to have a proper relationship with this very complex country. They've always made it clear you pick your system of government, we've got ours. And ours is going to remain dictatorial, communist, and we've been around for 5,000 years, you've been around for 230, so be careful how you lecture us. And we can do that. And by the way, they consider themselves the middle kingdom and the rest of us are sort of outside that middle kingdom. And they are busy securing their lines of uh, supply, oil, energy, they're buying things around the world, they're All buying over. agriculture. Yeah and they are investing in their future. Whereas we are sort of looking around to see what it is we need to be doing. And so we can work with them and I don't think it's gonna result in a military conflict. Although as Madeline pointed out, there, there are some challenges with respect to what they're doing in the, in the China Sea. Real quickly, Africa. Question uh, came on Africa. Has the US done enough? No, but actually there are 54 countries in Africa and people need to... <laughs> Um, see the differences among them. Um, and, and I do think that there have been some very um, uh, important changes that have gone on. We can't underestimate the democratic election in Nigeria. I think that is very important. A, a president was defeated and left. Um, and I think that that is an important part. And I think we need to distinguish. Uh, now, you were talking about China. China is in there. And one of the things... I, I definitely do think that we need to do things to fix America, but we cannot allow ourselves to become isolationist while the rest of the world is moving on and the Chinese are doing all kinds of things and we need to be out there. So, Do you see signs that the United States is too isolationist? Yes, I do. And because, I mean, I, I really do think Americans don't want to be the world's policemen. Um, President Clinton said at first that we were the indispensable nation. I said it so often it became identified with me. But the bottom line is there is nothing in the word indispensable that says alone. It just means that we need to be engaged. And so it worries me that there is always this trend of let's, we do need to fix all the things you're saying. But I, I hope it's not taken as a way of saying we shouldn't engage abroad. Because if we don't, in partnership with others, then, in fact, we will be ceding an awful lot of value systems um, or um, a way that the United States can make a difference. I, I completely agree with Madeline. No, we, we can't become isolated. It's impossible for us to become isolationist, although there are tendencies in the country. Uh, and so while we are fixing our country and fixing the problems we talked about earlier, we have to remain engaged with the rest of the world. But I also believe that by fixing our systems, fixing our infrastructure, doing something about our legislative system, we're giving an example to the rest of the world that they should look at us and follow our example. But there are too many instances and, and situations in our country right now which, is not, which are not providing the best example for the rest of the world to follow our lead. I think we can squeeze in, uh, if we can, two more questions. So, Jason? Question from the University of Hawaii. And uh, the question is an interesting one. Uh, there's been much discussion about how the world is different today, but this question asks, uh, what is the same in the world today and what lessons learned during tenure as Secretary of State are still applicable today? I, I do think that what is the same is um, the sense that the United States has to have a, I mean, you can just watch where people are waiting to see what we are going to do. We have both sat at tables with other countries, and they wait to see what the United States is going to say. And the question is, when you're in a discussion, do you speak first in order to uh, set the table? Do you speak last in order to summarize? Or do you speak in the middle? The question is, where do we? But the, there is, we are, I believe, we are an exceptional nation. 
um, and some of it is the immigration and some of it is just our history, what we can't do is ask that exceptions be made for us um, in terms of uh, law and a variety of aspects. But I do think that what is the same is the need for the United States to be engaged. Something that is common throughout the world, and it, it was highlighted for me at a conference I chaired in Morocco just as I was getting ready to leave office. And we had all the nations of Europe there and all the nations of the, uh, of the Arab world. And we're talking about democracy. And uh, after everybody had said their piece, one of the intellectuals who was there, an Arab gentleman, raised his hand and he said, I'll tell you what's wrong out here. And I said, oh God, he's gonna say Israel. <laughs> um, and he said, we need jobs. We need jobs. And that just hit me because what it says is what everybody in the world wants is a better life for themselves and for their family. And so if you could provide a job that brings dignity into a home on payday, a roof over their heads, food on the table, school for the kids, health care, uh, they'll take just about any political system that will give them that. And so keep in mind that I think that these basic human needs and, and uh, desires and hopes fuel a lot of uh, what's going on in the world. China has understood that. The nations of Africa that are now properly handling their economies and getting rid of corruption and moving forward understand that. I think the, most of the Western nations understand that. But we've got to do a better job of helping those nations in the Arab world and elsewhere and other parts of Africa and parts of Asia to understand that it is non-corruption in your government, rule of law, human rights, and the creation of an economy that is a 21st century economy that will allow you to provide jobs for your people. Yep. Uh, that will be the major overriding thing. Absolutely. And for the youngsters asking about what we can do, not only get your education, make sure you're politically active, make sure you register, and make sure you vote every chance you get, and never pass up an opportunity uh, to vote because you're watching something on television. Yeah. <laughs> Last question from, uh, from the audience here. Very good. I'll read it verbatim because it's, it's a nicely put question. Do you think that liberty is an exotic plant that can only grow in soils with a certain history and culture, or more like an oak tree that can be planted anywhere? Well. You're the gardener. <laughs> I, I actually, let me say this, is one of the questions out there always was, is, um, is democracy something that um, is transplantable? And I believe that we're all the same. I, Colin was talking about jobs. I think people want to be able to make decisions about their own lives wherever they are. And it begins with where they live or what language they teach their children or religion. And so I never liked it when people said, well, that's, those are Asian values, for instance. Why would you try to talk about your values, their Asian values? I, uh, they have their values, and I don't believe that. I do think that actually liberty is something that people want. Uh, they, they want the economic dignity so that they can be free in order to make decisions about their own lives. And I don't think we should just say that certain people, whoever they are, um, have different desires in life. General Powell? I, I certainly agree. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in democracy, our form of democracy. I'm a believer in uh, individual rights those God-given rights contained in our Declaration of Independence. But I've also learned over the years that not everybody necessarily believes in or wants to follow our form of government. And so I love lecturing to them just as Madeline does. No, I don't lecture. I do. <laughs> no, I lecture them I, all the time. No. But I don't lecture them saying, come down out of those trees and uh, live like a Jeffersonian Democrat. I essentially say to them, look at what we've been able to accomplish by the system we have, yeah. by the democratic procedures that we have used, by the rule of law that we have operated under. Look what we've been able to do over these years, and look how we solve problems. Look at the resiliency of the American nation. All these crises we've had in the course of our history, we've come through all of them, um, and we will come through whatever is in front of us because of the nature of our system. But I'm not telling you that's what you have to do, because every nation has to respond 
with its own uh, understand it with an understanding of its own history, culture, religion, and other aspects of its society. And so I am delighted in telling people about my country and my system. But at the same time, I listen carefully to what they have to say about their history and their culture. We started talking about uh, discouraged how shared values, how that water's edge has, uh, hasn't had the same uh, impact that it had when at least the three of us uh, were uh, beginning our careers here in Washington. But I detect both from the questions and from the answers from both of you that there is an inner optimism you both have oh, yeah. about the absolute fundamental shared values of this country and through, uh, through hard times and harder times that you both feel that, that that core strength is there. Secretary Albright? Definitely. I mean, and I do think that um, there is something very, uh, Cohen was talking about the resiliency. I think that is a very uh, important aspect of American life. What we can't do is impose democracy. That's an oxymoron. And the bottom line is trying to figure out how we continue to be the example that people want to follow. But there is something amazing in, you know, people ask me what's the most important thing that ever happened to me? Becoming an American. They're flat out. There is no question about that. And the opportunities that one gets by being an immigrant that comes to the United States, I think we kind of had pretty much dream jobs. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I do think that that's what America is about. Yeah. I agree. I agree, please. But I'm, I'm as optimistic uh, about this country as I have ever been. And I've seen times much worse than these times. You know, we lived through a Cold War. We lived through segregation. Uh, we lived through the period, the worst, the most difficult period in, in my adult life was really 68 through 74-ish. When we were losing the Vietnam War, a president had been murdered in 63. Uh, we lost Martin Luther King in 68. We lost Bob Ken uh, uh, Bobby Kennedy in 68. We had race riots in the early 70s, and then a vice president resigned in disgrace, a president resigned in disgrace. We were in a recession, and there was still a Soviet Union looking at us saying, we told you they'd collapse. And then suddenly along came this Midwestern gentleman uh, you know, by the name of Jerry Ford. And he sort of stabilized things. And then we had a few difficult years, and then somebody who I think we all admire now, Ronald Reagan, he just walked in and said, hey, it's morning in America. <laughs> and we all said, he's right, it's morning in America. But it was that, it was that optimism that came back to us. So. Uh, and now, all these years later, it was the Soviet Union that was on its way out. They just didn't know it yet. And so I think that we have every reason to be optimistic. The young people who are here with us and are, are watching this in Hawaii, believe in this place. Believe in it with all your heart, because it is a wonderful place. And going back to immigration, for a final point, for me anyway, is that you have problems in Europe with immigration. You can see it every day in television. Uh, some of our Asian friends like Japan, Korea, and China are going to be in deep trouble because they do not have immigrants, uh, particularly China and Korea. And the difference with immigrants here in the United States of America, they want to become American. They didn't just come for jobs. They want to become Americans, and we should welcome all those who do wish to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, two remarkable Americans. <laughs> Before you leave, please let me give you a preview of coming attractions. Just as we could not imagine a better launch for the Daniel Inouye Lecture Series, we already have Senator Alan Simpson and Secretary Norman Mineta confirmed for next April. So put that on your calendars, stay in touch, and thank you again for attending this evening.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.